The sixth video in this series looks at normalised forms for second order differential equations. We're looking at second order differential equations of this form we have so far and asking ourselves what sort of behaviours we might expect as we change the parameters a, b and c. And the earlier video videos have looked at the solution um, and what happens when the characteristic equation has real roots or complex roots and we've looked at time domain solutions and solutions using Laplace techniques. What we're going to do next is introduce a standard form and this is particularly helpful for analysing solutions with oscillatory components and also is something that's very widely used um, in academia and industry and therefore important for students to gain familiarity. Generally speaking, this normalised form is for systems with complex roots, but you can also use it for those with real roots. Now, what I've done here is I've actually put down what this normalised form is. d2x dt squared plus 2 zeta omega n dx dt plus omega n squared x equals f. So you'll notice some of the decisions we've taken. First the coefficient of the highest derivative has been modified to be 1. And you can do that, obviously, by dividing throughout by whatever coefficient was there originally. The second coefficient is written in this, what might be called, odd form, 2 zeta omega n. And the third coefficient is written as omega n squared. I'm not too worried about um, the right-hand side. There could be a, a constant there or not, but it's not key to the discussions that are going to follow. Let's look at the different scenarios that could occur then. If this zeta variable is bigger than 1, then you can show that the roots of the characteristic equation are given here. They're minus zeta omega n plus or minus omega n times the square root of zeta squared minus 1. And the key thing is what's inside the square root. If zeta squared is, zeta is greater than 1, zeta squared is greater than 1, and so you get the square root of a positive number and therefore the key thing is here you get real roots. So you have a very easy way of characterizing a situation with real roots. You put it in normalized form and if the zeta is greater than 1 you know you have real roots. Conversely of course if zeta is less than 1 then zeta squared will be less than 1 and what's in the square root becomes a negative number so you'll notice I've switched them around here I've written 1 minus zeta squared but I can do that because I've put this j outside so you'll notice I now have two complex roots minus zeta omega n that's the real part plus or minus j omega n into root of 1 minus zeta squared so this zeta is really informative it tells us have I got real roots have I got complex roots now just for completeness if you have complex roots this is how you might write the solution. You notice the exponential, it's got the real part, minus zeta omega n, so again the zeta impacts on the decay rate. And also you'll see the frequency of oscillation is this omega n root 1 minus zeta squared. Now the different terms have names and links to behaviours and those are things that we want to build on in the next few videos. So I've rewritten what we just did on the previous slide. There's the differential equation, and here is the, um, the roots. So let's look at each point in turn. First of all, zeta is often called damping ratio. That's a word that you will hear a lot. Zeta is called the damping ratio. If it's less than 1, the system has some oscillation. If it's bigger than 1, you've got real roots. Next, this omega n term. That's a subscript n. And that's because it denotes what's often called the natural frequency. This is the frequency at which the system would oscillate if you had no damping. So if you got rid of this damping term, which essentially means removing the dx dt from the equation, you'll see you have a pure oscillator, and it oscillates at frequency omega n. And finally, this bit in the circle, is the actual frequency of oscillation. And you'll notice sometimes people might call this omega d, the d standing for damped frequency of oscillation, because you'll notice that omega n is multiplied by root 1 minus zeta squared, and therefore you're multiplying it by a number less than 1, 
so omega d is always less than omega n, so it's, it oscillates slightly slower. As you introduce damping, it oscillates slower than with no damping, and that's perhaps not surprising. Now, the damping ratio determines the shape of the sort of response that you get. So if this is close to zero, then you're going to have a system with very little damping. It's almost a pure oscillator, so the oscillation will dominate the decay. If the damping is close to 1, then essentially you're nearly in a position where you've got two real roots. And indeed, if zeta is close to 1, you'll notice this term here um, goes very close to 0. And so what happens is the decay dominates the oscillation. You have very little oscillation, very low frequency, and it's the decay which is most important. In system design, engineers will often look for the damping ratio to be bigger than the number. Now, this is arbitrary. You need to recognize it's arbitrary, something around 0.7, because what they're saying is if it's bigger than 0.7, then the decay is dominating the damping, and I'm quite happy. But if it's smaller than 0.7, then you start to get a lot of, lot of oscillation compared to the decay rate. We'll cover that more in later videos. But next, a figure, so you can see the idea of what's going on. So in this figure, we're looking at the responses of a system given by this equation here. You'll notice this coefficient is constant. Uh, it's 4x, and that tells you the natural frequency is 2. The, cons the coefficient of the d2x dt squared is constant. So the only thing I'm varying is this middle coefficient, and I've written that as 4 zeta. Now, as you change the damping ratio, you'll notice you get different behaviours. So first of all, let's start with a relatively high damping of 0.75. That's this red plot. And what do you notice? Fairly smooth behaviour, not much evidence of oscillation, a tiny overshoot perhaps, but responds fairly smoothly, goes to the steady state. What happens if I reduce the damping a bit more? So the damping is now 0.5. That's this blue curve. And what do you get? A bit more of an overshoot, a bit more obvious oscillation. So once you get to 0.5, you're beginning to say, well, perhaps that's oscillating a bit more than I would really like a real system to do. Perhaps it's overshooting a bit more than I would like a real system to do. What happens if you take damping down to 0.25? That's this green plot. And what do you see? I've now got a significant overshoot and very evident oscillation. And generally speaking, you'd be unhappy with that. And of course, the final example, what if I take damping down to 0.1? Well, of course, now you can see you have really do have a very big overshoot and very obvious oscillation, and the oscillation is dominating the decay. So you can see there's a fairly clear message here. As damping gets lower, the oscillation gets bigger, the overshoot gets bigger. Um, generally speaking, that would be undesirable. So the damping ratio is a parameter that determines the general form of response. If zeta is bigger than 1, you get overdamped responses, no oscillations. If zeta equals 1, you've got what's called a critically damped system, two real roots, and no oscillations. If zeta is less than 1, then you have an underdamped system, or an oscillatory system. So if you look back at the first five videos, you'll see we used words like overdamped and underdamped. And you can now see that there's a clear link between those words and this zeta value. Just a few examples. So here's an arbitrary ODE, x double dot plus 5x dot plus 2x equals 1. If you were to calculate the corresponding zeta, you'd see it's bigger than 1, and therefore this is an overdamped system. If you look at this next one, x double dot plus 2 root 2x two dot plus 2x equals 1. And again, if you were to calculate the zeta, you'd say for this one, it's 1. So you have a critically damped system. What about this one? x double dot plus 2x dot plus 2x equals 1. And now you find the zeta is getting smaller. It's 1 over root 2. So it's underdamped. Now, if you look at these examples, you'll see I've kept the right-hand side the same. And what I'm doing is I'm just making the middle coefficient smaller and smaller and smaller. And so the damping ratio is getting gradually smaller. So next, you'll see I've gone to x double dot plus x dot plus 2x equals 1. And now the damping ratio is down to 0.35. And that's very obviously underdamped. And finally, if I go down to something like this, x double dot plus 0.2x dot plus 2x equals 1, it's very underdamped, very low damping ratio, and you're likely to get a lot of oscillation.
this slide is here just to emphasize one interesting point. Although you can see as you change the damping ratio, you seem to have very, very different behaviors from something very oscillatory um, with low damping to something relatively small. Um, in fact, this blue one here is overdamped. Um, however, there's one thing that has remained the same, and it's just making that point, and you'll notice is the asymptotic value. It's where they settle, because the asymptotic value just depends upon this part of the equation, the steady state. And the steady state we haven't changed when we were changing the damping. A numerical example then. So what you need to be able to do is calculate the natural frequency and calculate the damping ratio. So we're going to illustrate that with an example here. So here's the normalized form. That's how you want to write it, as d2x dt squared plus 2 zeta omega n dx dt plus omega n squared x. And here's the equation you've been given, d2x dt squared plus 2 dx dt plus 2x. So what I can do is I can just match coefficients. So first of all, I say this term here has got to match this term here. So I get omega n squared equals 2, which tells me that omega n equals root 2. Next. I match the middle two of coefficients. So that tells me that 2 zeta omega n equals 2, which gives me that zeta omega n equals 1, which gives me zeta equals 1 over root 2. Another example, just to illustrate the point. So what you're going to do is you're going to write x double dot plus 6x dot plus 10x can be written as x double dot plus 2 zeta omega n x dot plus omega n squared x. And what we can do is we can match these two coefficients. So that gives us 10 equals omega n squared or omega n equals root 10. And next we can match these two coefficients, and that gives us 6 equals 2 zeta omega n, or zeta equals 6 over 2 omega n, which is 3 over root 10. Here's some examples for you to try by yourself. I'm just going to show this slide long enough for you to press the pause button so that you can write them down and try them. OK, I'm going to move to the next slide now. Please don't do that until you've tried the questions. Here are some examples of the answers for the questions we've just given. Again, press pause if you want to look at them and write them down. Some conclusions. We've illustrated the normal form of second order ODEs in terms of damping ratio and natural frequency. We've indicated that convergence and oscillation are closely linked to the damping ratio. And we've demonstrated how you can determine the damping ratio and the natural frequency from model parameters.